Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. Today we are here with Dr. Nomi Prince, geo macro economist, author, and founder of Prince Sites Global. Nomi, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, I've uh, been looking forward to this. Um, Let's start out like I always do and go ahead and give us your macro view of the world economy and financial markets. Okay, so right now the world economy is uh, bifurcated a little bit in that GDP in general is starting to slow down. For example, in the United States, our last read was 1.3% for the last quarter. If you adjust that for inflation, that's actually a negative growth rate for the U.S. economy. On a global basis, it's about 2.6% on average with countries like China and India and so forth over 5%. So we're seeing a fairly stable to anemic growth actually coming up now in the world economy. From a financial market, perspective, though, um, we have seen actually a lot of um, uptrends. For example, the United States market, the, the NASDAQ, the S&P, and so forth are at or near record highs, and they seem to be continuing to trend up, especially on the expectations uh, that the Federal Reserve will, in fact, cut rates, if not this July, then most likely um, in September. Why? Because the economy is slowing. Also, we're seeing a lot of um, impact in the labor markets now. The unemployment rate has risen in the United States to 4.1% from 4%. There's no reason that Powell, the head of the uh, uh, the Fed, could look at that and think that's that's a positive indication or a hot labor market indication of what's going on in, with respect to workers. Yeah. Um, inflation has ticked down a little bit, but we are still seeing prices rise, particularly in the commodity area, and that is because of geopolitical tensions throughout the world, realignments. Um, in terms of countries wanting to secure their own supply and, and sort of move prices about within their own supply, and the uh, growing need for um, nations for national security and energy transfer transformation reasons to secure their own supply. So a lot of factors um, in the global economy right now are, are at play. Okay, that's interesting. So we have positive GDP, but you're saying it's actually negative because we've had so much inflation. Yeah, and it's also at a, it, it's kind of come down to the trend of where it would have been had COVID not happened, right? Yeah. So we had COVID, everything shut down and everything had to come back up and that increased the, the expense of, of supply, that increased um, economic growth for a second because of course it was, it had stopped. Yeah. Um, and so now we're basically in the trend of where the economy would have been, particularly the U.S. economy would have been had that not happened. Okay. And in that trend, in Inflation um, would have been ticking up anyway. Prices do continue to rise. It's a question of the uh, the pace at which they rise, and that's what we are all focused on: the the rate of inflation. That is coming down, but prices are still going up. That yeah. means inflation is still rising, yeah. just a bit less quickly than it had um, in the wake of, of the time post-COVID. So we're really on trend for what has been a, a sort of weakish economy yeah. um, with rising prices. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. It's disinflation, it's not happening as fast, but right. things are not getting cheaper. Things are definitely not getting cheaper and the economy at the moment isn't growing fast. Okay, interesting. All right, uh, macro view. Uh, central banks, mm -hmm. you're a huge fan of central banks, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's say we put you in charge of the Fed. What reforms would you make to our central bank? Well, first of all, in uh, one of the major points of my, my, my talk um, at the Rick Rule conference in, in, in Florida is that um, the Fed is actually not relevant with respect to its dual mandate. What's its dual mandate? It is to control prices or yeah. reduce inflation, and it is to make sure we have full employment. Well, un well unemployment's going up, and they don't, can't really impact inflation because of what we just talked about. They can't impact the supply, they can't impact geopolitical tensions or events or the weather or anything. So if I were running the Fed, I would, I would recognize that. Yeah. And I would do my actual day job um, which is what really the Fed was, was purposed to do, um, which is regulate the banks. In fact, it was purposed to liquefy the banks, provide them capital if they messed up. It was created in 1913 in the wake of the 1907 panic, which really disrupted uh, particularly the New York or the East Coast banks, which hurt liquidity or money flowing towards the West for building and, and infrastructure and development. Yeah. Um, but today, I would not be providing liquidity just for the sake of it, particularly if I saw weakness in banks. I would take my role as a regulator in yeah. chief, which really, really should be the primary and is the primary role of the Federal Reserve yeah. uh, much more seriously because there are significant weaknesses 
in the financial system that are unfolding right now. And that um, even recently, when Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was talking to the Senate and the House Financial Services Committee, was kind of waving away, for example, the increasing problems that we're seeing in the commercial real estate sector, where those are very similar to problems that we saw rising in the subprime sector, which ignited the financial crisis of 2008, yeah. which took years to basically stabilize with 0% interest rates around the world, a lot of QE or bond buying and so forth. It really disrupted or permanently distorted, which, which is the name of my last book, the, the entire system. Yeah. Um, so bit of a long answer to your question, but, but I would recognize actual problems that are happening in my purview, yeah. um, and I would seek to find remedies to those and to be transparent about those so they don't hit the market like a ton of bricks, which they will yeah. when they erupt. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. So you kind of alluded to this, uh, but uh, is another financial crisis looming? What are the warning signs, and how can we protect ourselves against that? Yeah. So again, one of the one of the main problems that we're seeing right now um, that banks are seeing, particularly regional banks, but but really not confined to those as Powell might <clears throat> want to believe, yeah. um, is that the rate of delinquencies or defaults in loan payments on those commercial real estate loans yeah. is on pace to be higher than the pace it was before the financial crisis of 2008. That's incredible. What does that mean? It means if you zoom out and look at the chart of the increase of those delinquencies and defaults, it looks similar to what we were seeing in 2000, end of 2006 and 2007 and early 2008. 2008 opened with a, a major crisis at Bear Stearns. I used to work for Bear Stearns. I wasn't there at the time, um, which created an entire um, tension within the banking system that got worse and worse and worse until September 2008 when Lehman Brothers, where I also used to work but not at the time, uh, failed. And that created the bailouts <clears throat> and all of the uh, Federal Reserve policy that followed that, that we're basically in the wake of right now. Um, those things are growing, and they're actually worse than the regional banks or the commercial banks that, that do lend to the regional banks, even though most of those loans are concentrated yeah. um, in regional banks. They're not isolated. And as we saw with the subprime crisis, things don't have to be, uh, those loans didn't have to be um, part of every single bank's book, every single bank's balance sheet. They just had to go wrong in certain places for the whole financial system to really collapse around um, all of the uh, all of all of the trouble those cost. So commercial real estate now is is, is not a hundred percent transparent. Banks are not really showing what's really going on. It's worse than what they're showing. It's worse than those rates being faster than they were in two thousand eight. Yeah. Because they have not marked down. They've, they've basically not reevaluated um, the actual properties that underlie these loans. Yeah. So they have not evaluated those offices that are vacant and the buildings that contain them. They have not reevaluated um, the leases for those offices that were long-term leases that mm -hmm. were basically are coming due that these, these that companies- That are expiring. Yeah, yeah. they're gonna expire and these companies are not gonna renew because there's nobody in the offices. Yeah. All of that is gonna decrease the value and it's already decreased the value of, of the collateral of these properties and, and banks are not showing that. Um, so is that a financial crisis in the wake? Yes. Is that going to really uh, potentially do what happened in 2008? Not necessarily, because I do think in, if, if that gets really bad, that whoever is in charge of the Fed, if it's power, whomever, will have to actually do something, and that will look like printing money. That yeah. will look like quantitative easing. All of that uh, creates more money supply and liquidity. It doesn't really fix this problem or this crisis that is, it is um, you know, sort of brewing behind the scenes. Interesting. You know, I, I really, I saw the, the beginnings of that when uh, uh, Rickards was talking about it uh, during COVID, that, that there is a commercial uh, real estate wall that is coming. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, here we're finally starting to see the fruition of that. Although yeah. they're not showing it yet on their balance sheet, but it is absolutely there. It's absolutely there. The only thing they have to show on their balance sheet, which is uh, what we're talking about, is the indication of, of non-payment. Yeah. The delinquencies, the defaults, that they have to show that because that's money that they had expected and they had sort of um, put in their books was going to come in and it's not coming in. Yeah. That's not reevaluating the properties. And that's yeah. why we are seeing the signs. And, and, and you're right, since, since COVID, yeah. our entire behavior pattern has changed. Yeah. Um, people aren't in offices. Yeah, there they're is working not from home. A need. And also, um, there's another component of commercial real estate, which is one to four uh, family homes, so multi family homes. <clears throat> and those are impacted. Excuse me, I'm going to yeah, have do to think? do some water on this one. <laughs> Excuse me, and those are going to be impacted by the overall 
uh, increase in cost of getting mortgages. Yeah. So as rates have stayed up, yeah. mortgage costs have gone up. Yeah. And so multifamily homes are really just as out of reach um, as single family homes for certain major sectors of the yeah. economy. And that's also part of that commercial real estate um, sector. It's included in, in, in those figures and has not been reevaluated. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, let's move on to this is, okay, the election. So you, you study politics. Um, what do you see? Ironically, Biden has been amazing for uh, oil. <laughs> He has. Right. He's, he's opened up reserves. Uh, oil has come down from its highs to where it is right now. Exactly. Yeah. Ironically, mm -hmm. he's been amazing for oil. Um, what do you see leading uh, in a, um, uh, we'll say maybe a Democratic win? What do you see in a uh, Republican win as far as, we got to take the hand we're dealt. What sh how should we position ourselves as investors with either of those outcomes? Well, I think, and you know, you, you mentioned oil. The the, the energy sector is, is really pivotal um, to everything as investors, yeah. and and therefore the commodities that drive um, different parts of the energy sector. Um, and so, for example, uh, the Biden White House uh, about a month ago put out um, a big new policy statement on the need for the United States to upgrade its power grid. Yeah, this is something that both parties agree on, but for different reasons. Yeah, so. The Democrats want a better power grid in order to be able to hook into it solar, wind, hydro, EVs, and so forth. Or that's, yeah. that's the policy platform, yeah. right, on, on, on the surface. Yeah. Uh, the Republicans want a better grid to be able to deliver cheap coal, natural gas, um, and oil-related uh, power. Yeah. Um, that's the, the sort of two statements, but they, they arrive at the same conclusion, which is that we need to be building as a country uh, more sustainable, modernized power grids. Um, to the tune of somewhere between uh, a cost of a half a trillion dollars to a trillion dollars. Yeah. What does that mean? That means that um, we're going to need more copper, we're going to need more um, wiring, we're going to need more workers, we're going to need more aluminum to create some of the external parts of power plants, more steel and so forth. So yeah. there's this call on commodities no matter who um, is running the White House, for example, because of that component of, of energy necessity. Yeah. If we look more towards energy transformation, there, there's one other major um, point of agreement across uh, parties and for whomever would be in the White House, and that's our nuclear energy policy. Over the last year and a half, there have been four significant uh, bills that were bipartisan that were signed into law that actually ignite our nuclear energy entire power structure from uh, a Russian ban uranium bill that basically ignites domestic suppliers and domestic miners of uranium and our yeah. allies um, that, that, that work with us on, on uranium supply away from Russia and Kazakhstan where um, a lot of our supply has come from. Uh, there was an act called the Advance Act that ignites the technology that will be used to distribute nuclear power into army bases and into communities, which um, would be through technology called SMRs and, and MMRs or small modular yeah, small reactors. Modular there's also funding for the large plants. So basically from, from, the, from the supply uh, to the technology to reopening nuclear plants and rebuilding plants, all of that nuclear policy has been signed into law um, over the last year and a half, actually particularly in the last nine months. Um, and all of that has been bipartisan based. So again, either White House, we are going to see more demand for uranium, domestic suppliers, domestic miners. So if you're an investor, okay. um, that is a very, very good place to be. Um, I was asked earlier this week what, 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 what commodity will probably have the most upside over just the next year. I mean, yeah. Some of these are more longer term, more trend oriented. Um, and I think that is uranium. And so okay. when, you, when you invest in the specific miners, which ones have domestic alliances with the United States government? Because that is a tremendous shift that's bipartisan. Um, in other cases, if it's, if it's a, a Democrat or a Republican White House, um, there might be differences in terms of how we see natural gas leases um, sort of evolve or, or how we see funding for solar. Okay. But the reality is, again, when you step back, yeah. tariffs, for example, on, 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 on solar flights were basically put into place by the Trump administration and yeah. they were expanded under the Biden administration. Yeah. So the idea of actually supplying even our alternative energy sources like solar energy and solar panels is also something um, that really runs across either the Democrats or the Republicans and whoever is in office. Um, one final thing, uh, the Biden administration just increased tariffs for permamagnets. Permamagnets oh. are um, just a little bit um, increased tariffs from 0% to 25%. So when, okay. the, when the Trump administration put out tariffs against China in 2018, they included a lot of 
categories, including solar, included semis, and a bunch of different things. The Biden White House expanded them from 0% and basically put permamagnets on the map of tariffs. I think no matter who is in the White House next term, those are going to increase. But what mm -hmm. that means is that the United States is, after going through the nuclear exercise yeah. in uranium, is acknowledging that we also need our own supply of rare earth elements, mm -hmm. um, domestically or from allies. And, and the first signal of that in terms of policy yeah. uh, did just come from the Biden White House, and I believe it would be augmented by, by any White House um, yeah. over, over the year to come in order to, to basically bring the idea of rare earth uh, production, distribution, and sourcing to, to our allies and, and out of the control of China, who right now uh, control 60% of the source and 90% of the processing of that source. So even if we find other source for rare earth elements and we want to put them in per permamagnets to go into yeah. our defense systems, yeah. we're basically buying them, buying from, China. them from China. <laughs> and so so I think I think we have to really look at not, not what the differences could be from an investing standpoint, yeah. especially in this area, which is a broad area. We're talking about yeah. all of energy, all of commodities, infrastructure, yeah. um, and look at where either way, especially as investors, we want to position ourselves um, for upside. Interesting. Okay, so this is a perfect segue uh, and a listener question from Adam. I know you got a heart out. I want to re respect that. Um, he's basically saying um, uh, that you joined, I'm sorry, not from Adam, from uh, Sylvia. She said, uh, you just recently joined the board on Meteoric Resources, which is ironically in uh, rare earths. Mm -hmm. is, and that's probably one of the reasons that you yeah. joined it. You see this coming I and do. you want to get in front of it. That, no, that's exactly right. I, I, I have remained pretty independent of, of boards, yeah. um, except for some nonprofits, yeah. um, but in, in, the, in, in, the, in the corporate sector. And the reason I was drawn to Meteoric Resources, and I went out and I explored their mine site, did due diligence on their Earth Element project in the Caldera, which is in Brazil. Yeah. It's about three hours outside of Sao Paulo. Um, and there's a couple things that I, I feel about the space and, and about the company. One is in the space, as we just talked about, rare earth elements are a necessity for literally everything okay. um, because of their, their magnetic properties in particular. There's four rare earths out of the 17 um, that are very specifically needed for magnets and, and also in semiconductors um, and in uh, logistics, missile, and defense systems. So they're of high requirement for national security purposes. We don't want to get those from China. Yeah. So where do we get the, the product from and where do we get the product? Processing from well, this Meteoric um, has a project called Codera. It's a 250-kilometer project on the surface of the Earth. Yeah. So what does that mean? Rather than some other rare earth projects, for example, in China, in actually near uh, Antarctica, near Russia, Siberia, um, those are projects where like you have to dig and dig, deep and underground, like, really deep. They're expensive. They require a lot of energy, etc. The Brazil project, the Meteoric has a Codera project. First of all, Brazil's energy source is 100% clean. It's hydro. Um, and also the rare earths are very, very at surface or close to surface. So the, the, the amount of disruption that you do to the earth is limited. Yeah. Um, and three, and I see this in mining companies in general, I like what Meteoric is doing, and, and this is what I look for in any mine in any commodity now, because governments are, are paying more attention to their supply chains. Therefore, where they are funding their mines and where they're getting their supply. And uh, sustainability actually is becoming more and more important in getting government subsidies, grants, and funding. Yeah. And also development subsidies, grants, and funding. Yeah. Um, and what, what Meteoric does is it backfills even the small amounts of drilling that it does as it's, as it's okay. searching for these elements. So when you look back at the horizon, you, you don't see a disruption. Huh. And then they plant trees on top of those holes. So, okay. so it's, it's very, very specific. So I, I think what they're doing and also the idea of how this expands into the entire rare earth space is going to make that significant um, process. Uh, more important on a national security basis and, and an alignment basis in the world. So that's one of the reasons I, was very, I am very excited to be a part of, of that project and a part of that board. Yeah. And also, as we discussed, this is, this is part of a, a large geopolitical realignment, yeah. um, having domestic supply of, of rare earths and ultimately processing that doesn't rely on China. Yeah, interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any closing thoughts? Anything you want to leave our viewers with? Well, I think, um, and we, we've covered this, I think the most important thing um, is to look at the main trends and kind of step out of the political noise that inevitably happens. And, and those trends are geopolitical realignments, energy transformation, and, and infrastructure development. And, and these are the things that I, that I focus on at print sites, um, at my substack, printsites.substack.com. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, every single piece that I am writing, and I encourage your, your, your viewers and listeners to subscribe, 
is about the intersection of those geopolitics, the energy and other economics, and the financials um, behind all of those um, investment and actionable suggestions. Okay, awesome. Dr. William Prince, thank you very much. There thank will you. be a link down in the notes below. And thank you for tuning in. Be sure to support the show and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. You have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.